Mother's Day, pastors have to exercise extreme caution when they pick the scripture passage for the morning sermon. Uh, I was thinking back at a story about a young pastor, and he got into the pulpit on Mother's Day, and he began by reading the passage of scripture. He was supposed to read from 2 Timothy chapter 1, where it says, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am persuaded, lives also in you. That is like the perfect Mother's Day text. Uh, But the young pastor was nervous, and when he got in the pulpit, he messed up, and instead of reading from 2 Timothy, he read from 1 Timothy. And to make matters worse, he began by saying, I dedicate this scripture reading to all the mothers in our congregation. And then he began reading, some of you have wandered from the faith (laughs) and have turned to meaningless talk. You want to be teachers of the law, but you do not know what you're talking about. The law was not made for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, and for those who kill their fathers and mothers. (laughs) Uh, Not surprisingly, shortly after that, this pastor got called to another church. That's uh, funny how that worked. Well, I hope you have patience for that young pastor because I think I need your patience this morning. Uh, The passage that I have chosen for this Mother's Day is pretty close to being as unconventional as that 1 Timothy passage. Today we'll turn to Genesis chapter 29. And instead of getting some kind of romantic, rosy view of motherhood, we'll look into the life of a wife and a mother who was largely ignored and neglected. And while it's my prayer that today's sermon will encourage all mothers, I trust it will be especially helpful to the women among us who are discouraged. I trust the sermon will speak to all women and to the women, wives, mothers among us who are overlooked and underappreciated. Well, look at the story of a lady named Leah. And Genesis chapter 9 tells her story. Leah was the daughter of a man named Laban. And the first thing the Bible tells us about Leah isn't very flattering. This is how the Bible introduces us to Leah in verses 16 and 17 of Genesis chapter 29. Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, And the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. The Bible says Leah had weak eyes, and that's a very polite way of saying that she wasn't very pretty. She was plain, and she may have been downright unattractive, especially when compared to her younger sister, Rachel. I was thinking several years ago, I, I had a lady in the church come up to me, and, and she had a college-age daughter, and the college-age daughter was going to another local church, and it was a new church, and so this mom wanted to know if I knew anything about the church or the pastor of that church, and it turns out I did. So I told her about the church. I said all kinds of good things. It looked like it was just a great work that was going on, and then after telling her all that, I, I made one more comment, it turned out like one comment too many, I said, you know, that pastor, he, he's a really good looking man. And she said to me, she says, oh, I know. Uh, you know, I've seen him. She goes, you know, I, you, I don't think I could go to a church with a pastor that's good looking. She says, I, I, I'd find it way too distracting. And here I am, I'm <laughs> nodding in agreement with her. I'm thinking, yeah, then we, wait a minute, I am your pastor. <laughs> When I, when I pointed that out to her, we were both laughing. Oh, this is funny. But yeah, you think about Leah. I mean, her physical form, her unattractive look, yeah, there's nothing to laugh at. And this must have gone with her day in and day out through her entire life. How painful that must have been for her. Well, her story continues as a man named Jacob comes to town. Uh, Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, 
I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Jacob lay with Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. Uh, let me explain what's going on here. Uh, what we learn about Leah in this section of the story is uh, she was alone in a loveless marriage. The big story in Genesis 29 is of Jacob. Jacob coming into this town, coming into this family. Jacob is a tall, dark stranger from far away. And he goes to Laban's house looking for a wife. Jacob sees Rachel, and immediately, it's just like head over heels in love. He's just stunned by her beauty. He falls in love with her on the spot. And so he seeks her hand in marriage. He goes to Laban, the father, and asks if he can marry Rachel. Well, the custom of the day was that the oldest daughter, she would be the first to marry and then the youngest. But Laban made this deal with Jacob, and Jacob agreed to work for Laban for seven years. Then at the end of that seven-year period, Laban, the deal said, would give Rachel to Jacob as his wife. Now, seven years, that's a long time. But Genesis 29, 20 says that they only seem like a few days to Jacob because of his love for her. Uh, seven years, that may have seemed like a few days to Jacob, but it must have felt like a lifetime to Leah. In that entire time, in all of those seven years, no one had come for her. In those seven long years, no eligible bachelor had fallen in love with her and had gone to Laban to try to strike some deal. At the end of this seven-year period, Leah's still alone. Uh, there's no one for her. And so it comes time for Jacob and Rachel's wedding. They would celebrate for a whole week. The feast got off to a great start, and spirits are high. That evening, Jacob took his bride into the wedding tent. Now, we don't get a lot of detail in Scripture, but it must have been some kind of party. It must have been plenty of champagne, because when Jacob woke up the next morning, he didn't look into the eyes of Rachel, the one he'd worked for. He looked into the eyes of Leah. Laban had tricked him. Instead of giving him his bride, Rachel, Laban gave him Leah. And here they are. They're married. It's all Laban's doing. It's done out of shameless uh, treachery. And what it ended up doing was creating this horrible love triangle between Jacob and Rachel and Leah. In Genesis 29, 30, it said, Jacob lay with Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. Laban asked and made a deal with Jacob again, and the deal was that Jacob would work another seven years, and then he would get Rachel. That's what happened. So seven years later, 14 years total, then Jacob and Rachel are married. And Jacob's also married to Leah. But we're told he loved Rachel more than Leah. Uh, this is strange to us. It's not uncommon in the Old Testament times. It's not uncommon for a man to be married to more than one woman at a time. And today, bigamy is uncommon. And yet I thought, you know, today women, though, they, they still can share their husbands with other interests and other activities. You know, what about the man who's married to a woman and he's married to his work? Or what about a man who has a wife and some kind of all-consuming hobby? Or what about a man who's married to a woman and the Red Sox? Is that a little too convicting? If I move on from that. Well, Leah's story continues. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben. For she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. 
Surely my husband will love me now. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now at last, my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, This time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. The third thing we learn about Leah is, well, she became a mother. That still didn't do it. She still didn't receive the love and respect that, that she craved and, frankly, that she deserved. She was a good mother. Even though she was a good mother, she was still inferior to Rachel. Leah responds to this very painful situation by striving and, and reaching out to her husband in the only way she knows and with the hope that she's going to win his love. So she has children. She's hoping that a baby, if she can bring a baby into this marriage, and that somehow this will bring she and her husband close to one another. This will cause Jacob to love her. Now, in fact, she has four babies in this passage. The first child is Reuben. The name Reuben means God has seen my misery. Is that for a name? And she delights in Reuben's birth and says, surely my husband, surely my husband will love me now. But Reuben doesn't bring them any closer to one another. So she has another child and, and then another. And she names her third son Levi and says, now at last, my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. But once again, even the birth of these three boys, it, it's not enough to win Jacob's love. Humanly, this is a very <laughs> sad story. Uh, it leaves us angry. She's just being horribly mistreated. This isn't fair. It's not right. But thankfully, we're not alone in those kind of feelings. Thankfully, someone else sees this injustice. And the one who sees that is the Lord. The Lord then, he steps into Leah's story. And how does God intervene? First, he sees this weak-eyed woman. Listen to what she said. Uh, verse 31, when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, and then she says herself in verse 32, the Lord has seen my misery. So God saw that she wasn't loved. God saw the misery, and God did more than just see how Leah was being mistreated. In verse 33, Leah said that the Lord heard that I am not loved. Now, this is great. This is beautiful. And Leah has these weak eyes, but God has very strong eyes. He saw how Leah was hated. He saw her misery, and he heard her cries. Leah was hated and neglected by her husband, and God took notice. He knew exactly what Leah was going through. God saw, God heard, and then God acted on Leah's behalf. What did God do? God honored this mother. He honored this neglected woman. Let me tell you a story. Jacob was the grandson of Abraham, and Abraham was the father of the nation of Israel, and and Abraham is the one that God handpicked to become what was the beginning of a blessing that would extend around the world. And God had made some amazing promises to Abraham. God promised to give Abraham and his descendants a land, property, to call their very own. And God had promised that through Abraham, as I said, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Another great promise. Now, interesting thing about that is, especially this promise of land, is that when Abraham died, we find that he only had owned one piece of land in his entire life. And it wasn't this big old, you know, massive stretch of land where an entire country could live. And it was a field. It was a burial plot. It was a small piece of dirt where 
he could be buried, where he could bury his wife and, and where his family could be buried. Abraham originally bought the property so he could bury Sarah, his wife, love of his life, his love of his life. He buried there, and then later Abraham himself was buried next to Sarah. So this is a very cherished place. This is a place of, of great meaning. It's a, a burial plot that signifies God's work in and through Abraham. Later, uh, Abraham and Sarah's son, Isaac, was buried there, and he was beside his wife, Rebecca. So Abraham and Sarah, now Isaac and Rebecca. And then, of course, Jacob was to be buried there. But interesting it, is that only one of Jacob's wives would be buried next to him in that plot, in that family plot. Now, I would have expected it to be Rachel. That, that's who would have ended up there. But God saw to it that it was Leah who was buried in that cherished place. Rachel died as Jacob and his family, as they were traveling. Rachel was buried along the way. She was buried alongside the road, and a memorial was set up for her. She was dignified in her death. But Leah received a greater honor upon her death. Immediately before Jacob died, he gave these instructions. He told his sons this. And Jacob gave them these instructions. I am about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite, which Abraham bought as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite along with the field. There... Abraham and his wife Sarah were buried. There Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried. And then he says, and there I buried Leah. It's interesting how God works, isn't it? And here, this woman who had not been honored, who had been neglected, she's laid to rest in this place of greatest honor and greatest significance. But that really that's pales in comparison to the other blessing, the second way God honored Leah. Uh, when God selected one of the sons, one of Jacob's sons, to pass this blessing through, God selected Judah, Leah's fourth son, as the child that he would carry out his promise to bless all the peoples of the earth through. You know who eventually came out of the line of Judah? Our, our Lord Jesus Christ, which brings eternal glory to Leah. This weak-eyed woman, she's seen by God, by God's strong eyes. This lonely wife is loved by God. And this mistreated, neglected woman is honored by God. I want to give a couple of Mother's Day reflections. What do we do with this story? Let me suggest two things, uh, one for men and one for women. The first reflection is for men, the men among us, and that is, men, praise your wife. <laughs> praise her. Love her. Value her. Cherish her. Uh, adore her. Treat her as a gift from God because that's what she truly is. Now, Jacob is looked back upon as this great man of faith, this great hero of the faith. And in some ways, he was. He was a terrible husband. He was a, a horrible husband to Leah. I have respect for Jacob, a lot of things in Jacob, but I sure don't respect him as a husband. Men, uh, we should never put our wives in a position, ever put our wives in a position where they have to question our love for them or question the value that they bring into our lives. Men, praise your wife. Look for every opportunity to do so. Second 
application is for, mo- for moms, for women, all women. And ladies, follow Leah's example and, and praise the Lord. Leah, she spent her whole life looking for love. Actually, she didn't spend her whole life looking for love. She spent a lot of her life looking for love. But something changed. I mean, as I said, this is a sad story. Uh, I'm going to be the best wife I can be. I'm going to have these children, she's thinking, hoping that my husband will love me. He, he will show me the, the affection that I need, that I deserve. Now, listen to her. It's, it, when Re- Reuben was born, she says, surely my husband will love me now. When Simeon's born, the Lord has heard that I am not loved. When Levi's born, now at last my husband will become attached to me. Uh, it didn't work, didn't work, didn't work, didn't happen. Finally, Judah's born, the fourth kid, fourth boy. And she says something different. She says, this time, I will praise the Lord. Yeah, you know, no response from her husband, over and over again. And she finally realizes And she finally determines that God loves her, and she's going to focus her attention, not on trying to receive her husband's love, but she's going to turn her attention on the love of God and God's love for her. Leah, uh, in this despair, discovered this deep, deep truth, and that is that no matter what our circumstances, our, our needs, our ultimate needs, are only met in God and his son, Jesus Christ. No child, no husband, no pursuit of any kind can meet those deep needs in our lives. Now, Leah was not loved as she should have been, and that's not a good thing. But God brought good from it. Instead of becoming a bitter person, Leah became a truly beautiful person. And her beauty came from within. It came from this complete dependence upon God. Before I close in prayer, I want to read one verse from Proverbs 31. This is the kind of verse you'd expect to hear on Mother's Day. I'm going to let this be the final word. We're told in Proverbs 31, charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you on this Mother's Day. We praise you for every woman, wife, and mother in our lives and in the life of our church family. Lord, look upon those who are overlooked and love those who are lonely. And Lord, we ask you to bring special honor to every woman who continues praising you even in the midst of personal disappointment. We give you thanks for every happy home, and we give you thanks for bringing comfort, love, and hope to each and every hurting heart. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.